Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. We're having a returning guest on tonight's program. Uh, in some ways, the reason I've asked Father Donald Coll Colloway to come back is because uh, the, he mentioned the last time he was on The Journey Home program, he only just scratched the surface of his journey. So it's great to have Father Calloway back. Uh, he also came out recently with a book on his journey, No Turning Back, which gives a little more detail of his uh, story. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later. He's a former Episcopalian, though it, when you hear a story again, you realize that that doesn't quite describe it either because uh, he's got a lot more aspect to his journey. Uh, later in the program, we'll take some emails. Our, the email is Marcus, no, excuse me, journeyhome at ewtn.com. So uh, let's invite you back. Father, it's good to have you back. Thanks, today. Marcus. I appreciate it. Great to be back. So much has happened since the last time I was on the program. Yeah, and I know that, uh, what's it been, about five years or so? About five years, I think, yeah. And uh, you had said that you had had, uh, which is always neat to hear the emails you get after being on the show. But in a way, the way that I'm describing tonight's episode with you back on the program is yeah. kind of the, the rest of the story. Right, yeah. Uh, because not only do I want you to fill in some of the gaps that you didn't mention last time, right. which you, you bring out in your book, mm -hmm. but also maybe a sense of uh, what I've found is that often after uh, people have been in the church longer, you're, you're a new convert the last time or fairly recent. Now That's you've been right. in longer. Have you come to appreciate certain aspects of the church that you didn't when you first came in? But let me get out of the way sure. and ask you, let's start back with your journey again. <laughs> there may be somebody watching right now that didn't hear you at all last time. Yeah. So why don't right. you give a gist of it? Yeah, the nutshell version, uh, I can do this for hours. I go, travel across the world doing this all the time now. And uh, the nutshell of it is that um, I wasn't raised in any Christian faith whatsoever. Uh, my parents were not Christian. They didn't really even believe in God. And um, uh, Had they been and rejected it? They, just, they no, themselves had never been. They never were. Um, uh, my mother and my father. Now, I was in, uh, my mother was in three different marriages. So okay. my third father, my stepfather, he was an Episcopalian, but only nominally. He didn't right. really practice. Um, right. So when he adopted me when I was nine years old, I actually was baptized uh, when I was 10 into the Episcopalian Church in Southern Virginia. Uh, but once again, it didn't really have an impact on the family. Um, they didn't even take any photos of the, of the baptism. It didn't really mean anything for them. We never went to church after that. And uh, he was a military officer, so we moved constantly. If you, you know, the military life is crazy. Every two to three years, you're moving, yep. bumping around somewhere. So we were in Southern Virginia, then we were in Los Angeles, San Diego, and then we went to Japan, and my life just became chaos. I uh, really, as a young boy, a teenager, I really mm -hmm. bit onto the culture and, and all of its sensual, gratifying things, and really went down a bad path. Ended up running away in Japan, causing an international scene, <laughs> uh, grew my hair down to my, my waist, had long hair when I was a teenager. I think I saw a picture of that on your website. Yeah, it's on there. The guitar, right? That's yeah. right, that's right, that's, that's me. <laughs> uh, my mom wishes that picture wasn't in existence, but uh, it is. Um, and I actually got deported from the country of Japan because of the criminal activity that I was doing there. Came back to the States, went to a rehabilitation center. Um, that didn't help me out. I actually ended up dropping out of school, followed uh, Grateful Dead, the old hippie band around for a while on a Volkswagen bus, doing all kind of crazy, immoral things. Ended up in another rehabilitation center uh, and then ended up in jail in Louisiana. Just a horrible life. But during that all, all that time that I was really... Um, a product of the times in which we live, this culture of death and, and sensuality, my mother, my stepfather, and my half-brother, um, they all had a conversion to Catholicism. And I joke around with my mother. I tell her, Mom, uh, I drove you so nuts that you needed God, and so you, you became Catholic. You know, She laughs at that. But um, they became Catholic, and they became very devout Catholics. Uh, and interestingly enough, the reason, the way that they became Catholics was because my mother had a, a Filipino woman who was a very devout Catholic. And, you know, I always joke around, if there's one thing in life you don't mess with is a devout Filipino Catholic woman because they're God's <laughs> little agents all over the world right now. And she got my mom to go talk to a Catholic priest. My mom loved what the priest had to say. Uh, she brought her husband, my stepfather. They became Catholic and radically changed. I mean, it was mm -hmm. very apparent to me that my parents were different. But I couldn't stand that because I was so selfish that I couldn't stand to be around that. And I continued my crazy life until I was going on 20 years old, rock bottom, uh, beyond, I had lots of rock bottom experiences. And um, 
God came into my life in a powerful way in 1992, in March of 1992, sitting in my parents' house. I picked up a book on my parents' bookshelf about these things called Marian apparitions. I had no idea what that was. What, what is a Marian apparition? No idea. And the book just radically changed my life and set me on a course of realizing that um, Jesus Christ is for real. That there is a God and there's only one and he's Jesus Christ. And that he loves me and that he died for me. And then even in the crazy life that I lived, and I lived a crazy life, it's all in the book, <laughs> um, that he was willing to forgive me and to show me compassion and tenderness and forgiveness. And that rocked my world. It really changed everything for me. And I ended up uh, my journey to Catholicism, uh, which you know took some time. And then obviously that journey led to something further, yeah, yeah. discerning the priesthood. Before we go there though, I want to re we didn't mention the title of the book, No Turning Back, A Witness to Mercy. Donald uh, H. Calloway, uh, uh, Marianites? Marians of Marians. the Immaculate Conception. Yeah, Immaculate. Yep. I'm sorry, Marians no of the Immaculate Conception. I wanted to mention that because I'm sure someone watching was interested in it, but I don't want to talk about the book because you're going to do a, a bookmark with Doug Keck. I want to make sure the audience turns to that and hears some more details of your book. Before we talk about your call to priesthood, I want to back up a little bit because it still amazes me that uh, my guess is that a large number of Catholics uh, and even non-Catholic Christians don't realize that there are still a fair number of people in America that mm. have never had any faith. Oh yeah, right. Have never had the gospel preached to them yet. We've still got yeah. the great mandate to do yet. Yeah. But what also amazed me about your upbringing, if you can think back, mm. put yourself in those shoes again. Mm. How did you determine what was right or wrong back then? Right, yeah. I mean, what were you thinking about? I mean, obviously, when you got to Japan, uh, but did, was there a sense of conscience, a sense of guilt at all? There was initially, obviously. I mean, it's, you know, there's some anthropological foundation there that on some level you know what's right and what's wrong. But as I went through and the world got a stronger chokehold on me, that really deteriorated through my teenage years. And so it became, because all that I learned in my school system was that I was a monkey. I come from monkeys. I'm nothing but a monkey. And so and after you're not a going while, anywhere. Yeah, right. This is cosmic goo that came out of existence through some chance, fortuitous event. There's no God who created so it. So it never crossed your mind that you one day would have to stand before anybody oh, accountable no. for anything you did in this life? Oh, absolutely not. Okay. That never, no, no, no way, no how. Okay. And so I only began to pursue those things that were centrally satisfying. If it felt good, you did it. And that's how my friends acted. And that's how actually the vast majority of people that I knew in my life acted. Um, tragically, that's how the vast majority of adults yeah. that I knew in my life acted. If they didn't like this particular marriage, it didn't feel good anymore, the wife wasn't as beautiful as she was when you were 18 and married her, well then you get a new one. That's the world that I grew up in. And so standing and having some accountability at the end of my life before some deity, oh no, that, that didn't exist. Uh, I lived like a monkey. Yeah. I pursued what felt good. In the early church fathers, uh, and I encourage the audience to do this if you can, uh, that if you read First Clement, mm. which would be one of the earliest documents at the same time as the New Testament, mm. right? Yeah. But the reason I mention that is if you look in that document, every time there's any reference of what a parent should do for their children, every time it says, bring them up in mm. the fear of the Lord, right? Yeah. the fear of God. And you're one that was brought up all your life without any fear of God at all. Oh, no, none whatsoever. Yeah. Which I do believe, my point is that we do have a lot of people living around us in America, oh, yeah. in the world, that do not have a good sense of the fear of God. Right. Or even what it means. And maybe there's even a few Catholics around that don't. Oh, yeah. Have oh, a fear sure. of God. Oh, there's quite a few, I think. I mean, <laughs> the first 10 years of my life, I wasn't Christian at all. When my mother remarried, uh, my stepfather was Episcopalian, so I was baptized. But that didn't put the fear of God in me because we never went to church after that. It wasn't something uh -huh. that we practiced. Jesus was as real to me as a 10-year-old um, baptized Christian, you know, as Jesus was as real to me as the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy. He was a mythological yeah. character that people made up to get a day off of work on December 25th. That was it. Mm -hmm. There was no reality to it for me at all. Yeah, and of course we live in a culture where a large part of psychology wants to say that fear is a bad thing anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, there's right. no sense of standing before our Creator accountable for how we've lived our life. 
Right. So in the midst of that, you get zapped with a call to yeah. the priesthood. Oh yeah, that was something I didn't see coming at all. I don't think anybody did. <laughs> and guess what it was again, you know, I, I joke around with my mother. It took her one Filipino Catholic lady to get her to come to the church. Uh, it was five Filipino women uh, for me. It took a, you know, a special little unit. Um, and I ended up uh, talking to these women and they, could, they saw me in church every day and I wasn't even Catholic yet. I was just going to Mass every day and watching what was happening because I was so in awe of what I was seeing. And they, they assumed that I was Catholic because I was there every day. And they came up to me, one of them in particular, and she said, you would make a very good priest. You should think about becoming a priest. <laughs> and that's when I had to tell her, lady, I'm not even Catholic. You, know, I, you don't even know my background. My litany of past indiscretions, they wouldn't let me anywhere near a seminary. But as, after I became Catholic and just kept praying, Lord, what do you want me to do with the life that you've given to me? You're giving me my manhood back, for one, because I really messed it up. What are you asking of me? Um, do you want me to get married, to have a beautiful wife, have kids? That'd be wonderful. You know, I'm a man, very much drawn to that. But I felt in my heart that he was saying, I want you to, be, to go out into the world because you really came from it, and I've drawn you out of it with so much mercy. And to go back now with this message to you know, the young people in particular, um, to let them know that I'm for real because they don't know it. Mm -hmm. Just like you don't, you didn't know it, mm -hmm. but now you do. And I want to send you back to them and I want you to do that as a priest. And I felt that call in my heart, responded to it, prayed, 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 and uh, was accepted to my religious community, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. Studied for 10 years, which was a long time for me to study. Why I, that community? Why were you drawn to that community? Yeah, that's a good question because there's so many different sure. religious communities. Um, well, I had come to know Jesus Christ through the Virgin Mary. You know, I, I had a relationship with her as my spiritual mother. And I figured, you know, if anybody really knows Jesus, gosh, it's not, it would be his mom, you know. <laughs> so, Mary, I really need you in my life in a sp special way to guide me through this so I don't mess it up. And so I ended up wanting to be in a community that had Mary's name in it on some level. So Marians of the Immaculate right. Conception. And they were, I found out, the promoters of the Divine Mercy message mm -hmm. given to St. Faustina, mm -hmm. you know, a Polish nun in the 1930s, which was a message of mercy and forgiveness for wounded, weak souls. I was the poster mm -hmm. child for this. You know, um, God had mercified me and just blessed me with so many graces of, of His mercy. So I wanted to be an apostle of mercy, and this was the community that spread that devotion, so it was a perfect fit. I've, uh, I've heard some who are not that impressed with the, the whole mercy thing. Mm. I mean, Jesus saved us, they say. Yeah. But what's your thought on that? Sometimes I think that if we don't appreciate the mercy yeah. thing, yeah. then maybe it's that we don't appreciate what's really been done for us. Yeah, and I don't think we would really appreciate that He's our Father. That's the whole point, is that Jesus came to reveal the merciful face of the Father. He is the Father of mercies. And, you know, in Hebrews, he's our high priest, you know, who is like us in all things but sin and, you know, underwent such excruciating agony in saving us and meriting those graces of our redemption, which is mercy upon yeah. mercy upon mercy for us because God is our Father and he loves us. He knows we're weak and wounded, you know, and, and that's why I want to be a part of this movement is letting people know about his mercy, that his fatherhood, because who doesn't need it? Yeah, I was going to say that to me that's the issue is that that we really haven't faced up to our sinfulness yeah. enough yeah. yet to realize and um, it's easy to recite the rubrics the mm -hmm. ritual of the mass every Sunday mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, almost without thinking Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. That's you can right. say that without even right. you can be thinking sure. about the football game this afternoon. That's right, yeah. Right? Yeah. And yeah. I'm thinking that's kind of it. If we don't appreciate the mercy thing, yeah. it's because we aren't really listening yeah. right. to how much we needed that mercy of God. Yeah, and we're called to, to be vessels of that mercy. You know, what St. Paul says, to go out and to, to be vessels, instruments, and in letting the Lord work through us to bring others into that mystery of Filiation, which is basically to come to the Father of mercies and to know that we need that and to be transmitters of that saving message. That's at the core of the gospel, the message of a Father who's merciful. You had mentioned to me, in, as you were thinking about this book, uh, 
that maybe the first time you're on the show you hadn't mentioned as as significantly as your mother was in your journey yeah. and you brought out more I'm going to talk more about that because it, sure. not only was it her conversion first but she saw you in yeah. your journey yeah and was there a big change in her as she watched you go through this oh you bet yeah and part of the reason that I put it such prominence in the book about my, my mother is because as I've gone out speaking, everybody's like, okay, that's that's great that you converted, but your mom's the real saint in all of this. You know, you're, you put your mom through a living nightmare, and they're right. Um, but she, when she fell in love with God, with our Lord Jesus Christ, her life radically changed, and she began to pray, you know, for the conversion of her son, myself. Mm -hmm. And when I had my conversion, now my mother and I are like the best of friends. I mean, I love her so much. We sit down, we mm -hmm. pray together. You know, we've traveled together now. She doesn't like to speak publicly. She's a little timid, you know, but when she gets up there and speaks, the audience is just captivated because, you know, so many mothers in our times are suffering yeah. for their children who have left the faith, become lukewarm or living immoral lives. And they need a message of hope and a message of, you know, persevere, keep at it. You know, God's going to listen to those tears of a mother, just like uh, God did with St. Monica, right. you know, the mother of St. Augustine, who was a bad boy in his day. You know, he, he was a little... <laughs> He raised Cain for his, for his mother, you know, he, he put her through a, a nightmare experience. But through those tears and prayers, years of perseverance, you know, he had a huge conversion himself. The, the, clarify the timeline here. Your mother converts, and your father, right? That's have, right. Have a yep. very, very powerful conversion. That's right. The timeline, where were you at in your spiritual journey when that happened to them? Oh, I wasn't in a spiritual journey at all. I mean, I, I was completely, I was a deadhead. I was following the Grateful Dead during that whole period. So... And this is the reason I'm mentioning this is because I know that there are, I know from emails, Mother mm -hmm. Angelica used to always receive emails from Catholics whose children had left the church and they had given up hope. Yeah, yeah. So at that point, when your mother and your father had this amazing conversion to Jesus Christ in this church, yeah. they would have had very little hope this is going to happen to you. Oh, you betcha. Yeah, my life actually got worse. It was when my mom became Catholic that I got thrown in jail went to my second rehab, and literally became homeless, living in a Volkswagen bus. And then when that broke down, I was on the streets. It got worse when my mother became Catholic. It, it didn't look like there was much hope at all. But sometimes that's the mystery of how things you know, operate. If you want to make a field fruitful, you put manure on it. That's the mystery of how God works in His vineyard, in His field. And it's only the soul that really prays and perseveres that you can penetrate through the winter for the springtime. My mom did. I was thinking about, there's a verse in the beginning of 2 Corinthians that says that we are comforted that we might comfort. Mm, mm, yeah. and, and I've often looked in that verse as a reference to answer why it is that God would, if His intent and the long big purpose was that you would be a priest, yeah, yeah. why instead of a pristine childhood right. did He allow you to go as far away as possible? Right, right. I mean, it is a mystery. It really is. And I, I think that's part of God's providential plan. Is certainly He didn't take delight in the fact that I really did some bad things and hurt, hurt people, uh, my family especially. Yeah. But I think in His plan, He allowed it to happen so that in His time, a greater good could come mm -hmm. from that manure on the field, right. so to speak. Because now, with all of the technological things that we have in the world, I've actually found friends from my past, and I've been able to spread the gospel to them I mean, this is the, the mystery of God's plan being worked out here, is that uh, it's beyond our understanding what He's doing, but yet so glorious. I mentioned in the beginning of the program that often, that one of the things I wanted you to talk about is, okay, you've been a Catholic now, how long? Uh, 1992, I converted. Okay, so, yeah. so we're talking 18 years? Yeah. All right. Well, the last time that we were on the program, you had just been a priest That's right. for two years. Yeah. Looking back, uh, you talked about your conversion in the church. What are some things, both as a lay Catholic and then as a priest, have you come to discover and learn the beauties of the church that maybe you didn't appreciate when you first came in, mm. that you've come to realize are great treasures now after you've seen the church uh, face to face? Right. Oh, gosh, there's so many I could, I could go into. I think uh, the one thing that probably stands out for me the most is because I'm still a sinner in need of conversion, mm. ongoing conversion. You know, the initial experience of God coming in and romancing my soul was, it was a honeymoon. It was sugar sweet. It was wonderful. But then, you know, the honeymoon goes away and you have to live the marriage, you know, and it, it, sometimes it's tough. 
And that's where I find now such an appreciation for the sacrament of reconciliation, for confession, because uh, it wasn't a one-shot deal. God knows that I'm going to stumble, I'm going to make mistakes, and because He's my Father, there's going to be an ocean of mercy. You know, He doesn't take delight in the fact that I mess up, you know, and, and, and do some stupid things. But because He's my Father, He's willing to take me back every time when I have a humble heart and say, Father, I did it again, and I'm sorry, and I need you. You know, that's the wonder of confession. I love it, I love it, I love it. And I'll love it till the day I die because it's, it sets me free every single time with the realization that you're my father and you love me. I was just thinking that uh, probably an awful lot of people have to come through that confessional to trump what you did. <laughs> yeah, probably. I make everybody else look good. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it makes him maybe comfortable to come in. He said, man, he's done a whole lot worse than I did. And if he's been forgiven, hey, then, right, right. then grace is coming my way. Yeah, the confession <laughs> line when I go to a conference is pretty long. <laughs> uh, we'll take a break in a little bit. Before we go there, talk more about your community, the unique uh, charism mm. of, of your community. And there are so many communities out there. Yeah. I know you mentioned yeah. a little bit of it before. But what would you say is the primary purpose mm. of what your community is trying to accomplish in the kingdom of God? Well, obviously, first and foremost for every community is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and to save souls. Our particular aspects of doing that are to um, let other people know about the goodness of His mother, the Virgin Mary, and her role in the Christian life and being mm. our mother in the order of grace, the new Eve, the mother of all the living. Uh, so we seek to spread devotion to her, and then also um, the divine mercy message, as I alluded to earlier. Mm. We, our community is a founded, was founded in Poland, and so um, we have some Polish roots there. And this uh, Sister Faustina was Polish, and so our community was entrusted in a special way with spreading this message uh, of divine mercy throughout the world. And so we do that in a big way, whether we, we run parishes, we have shrines, uh, we do missionary work in the Philippines, Brazil, Africa. Seek to spread, uh, you know, those aspects. There's a lot of other things as well, but that's that's the core of it. Why don't we take uh, our first email before we take a break? Because um, this it was in line with something that I was thinking about and asking anyway. So I'll just go with your email. Uh, this comes from George in Oklahoma. Father Calloway, as a convert to the Catholic faith, was there any particular Catholic doctrine that was difficult for you as you were considering becoming Catholic? Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, thinking back on it, um, at the time, Catholicism was so new to me, I was just in awe of, of it. As I learned more about the teaching of the church, contraception at first was a little mm -hmm. shock because mm -hmm. that was so contrary to my mentality growing up in the times in which we live. Contraception just seemed like a no-brainer that everybody did it. Of course mm -hmm. this was fine. I mean, uh, you know, they told me we have overpopulation on the earth and all those kind of things, you know, and they throw statistics at you that you just think, well, these are the scientists, these are the people who say it's true, so I believe it. So when I saw this teaching of the church that contraception is, you know, not good, the, the blocking of human life, um, it took me really to, to look mm -hmm. at that and to pray over that and then to see the beauty of it and the truth of it um, because it, came, it dawned upon me, you know what, what would it be like if Jesus on the cross said, you know, I love you, but not that much. I'm going to put a barrier between you and me, and I'm going to block my seed from giving you the fullness of life because I don't love you that much. He didn't do that. He was stripped naked and poured out his blood, that seminal blood that gives us life so that the church could be born because he's the bridegroom Messiah and gives to his bride all of himself. And that's what spouses have to do. And I see that in the beauty of this teaching in Catholicism of, of, of human life. It's beautiful. All right, well, let's take a break, and we've got a couple more emails that we'll look at when we come back in a, in a bit, so we'll see in a little bit. Welcome back to the journey home. We're having a good time talking over all kinds of things that uh, we could talk about in the program. There's never enough time. 
I want to remind you that uh, on Wednesdays, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, uh, EWTN allows me to have a radio program called Deep in Scripture, in which each week I have a different guest. I haven't had Father on yet. You'll have to join me <laughs> talk about your favorite Scripture. Uh, usually we focus on Scriptures we never saw. In other words, Scriptures that awakened us to a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ in the church. This coming Wednesday at 2 is uh, Guy Dowd will join us. So uh, that's 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on EWTN Radio. Please join us. I want to remind the audience again of your book, No Turning Back, A Witness to Mercy by uh, the guest Donald, Father Donald Calloway. And we've got a number of emails. Before we get to the emails, Father, though, I wanted to make sure you talked about, I mean, your main focus of your, your ministry that you became Catholic is, in fact, vocational yeah. ministry. Um, is there a priest shortage? Well, yes and no. I mean, we could certainly use more priests. There's no right. question about that. But is there a shortage of God calling men to the priesthood? No. Mm -hmm. It's just that men aren't hearing it because they're hearing other things that are out there in the culture, culture taking their attention and getting them preoccupied with all of the things that are optional for them, you know, to, to choose out there. And it's very distracting for men. I'm the vocation director for my community, and we're certainly not experiencing a shortage of vocations. We right now have 27 men in formation. We're going to accept another seven or eight later this year. We're busting at the seams wow. with wow. vocations. Uh, so it depends, you know, what, how are you out there fishing for them? You know, we're casting the net and drawing these men in because, you know, we love the church, we love the Holy Father, we love the Eucharist, and that's what these men are drawn yeah. to, and they respond to that. If you're out there saying some phony message, lukewarm, mediocre stuff, they're not going to respond yeah. to that. Yeah. Uh, what sets the Latin right apart from almost every other tradition is the uh, expectation of celibacy. Mm. And I'm wondering two questions. Uh, one, uh, how was that uh, in your own journey? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to think about those five Filipino ladies talking about the priesthood, yeah. but celibacy was right, right up front. Yeah. A little bit contrary to your previous yeah. lifestyle. You betcha. But then second of all, are you finding that a barrier even as you do your vocational work? Not at all. I can honestly say to you, I've been a vocation director since 2004. I have not had one single man come up to me and say, you know, I just don't think I can do this because I would like to get married. And I say to them, you know, uh, the men who come, look, if you feel called to marriage, that's a beautiful thing. Right. But I, don't, I haven't had any one man come to me and say, you know what, I just don't think that I could do that because I feel that I want to be a priest and be married at the same time. You know, in the Latin rite, that's, that's not going to happen, you know. Right. And, and so it's not a problem, not a problem at all. Guys actually that are discerning right now have come out of that cult, the culture, you know, that is so sensual. Um, yeah. They know, you know, what that's like, and yet they're willing to make that sacrifice, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as St. Paul says, those who can do it, do it. You know, if God's calling you to it, you will be given the grace to be able to do that. And they know that. They know they're going to, on occasion, feel it in their bones. We're men, you know, and the feminine is, what a mystery. Wow, you know, women are phenomenal. Uh, and yet when God calls a man to this way of life, you can make this sacrifice in your own body because you're being called into this mission to do it. God will give you the graces to be able to do it. Uh, not one single man have, have I talked mm -hmm. to uh, who, who has really had a gripe about this. Not one. If you were to look at it from your perspective of how long have you been a priest now? Oh, seven years. Seven years. Um, what would you say was maybe the, the number one reason of wisdom that the, the Holy Spirit has led the Latin Rite Church to mm -hmm. emphasize celibacy as a necessity of priesthood? From your experience, sure, what sure. would you say is the central reason why the wisdom of that uh well i, I think it's quite simple uh because you're you're going to be consumed every man is going to be given a beauty in his life to honor to defend to protect and to die for mm -hmm. the priest is given that as well it's the church it's the beauty of the church which really is you know the souls that he's mm -hmm. been entrusted with and to have that passion and that drive and that commitment uh, of all of your time and everything you have to be to go f towards that is so important. If, if, if you find yourself with a real physical wife and then you also have these souls that you're in charge of, you, you're going to be divided. Mm -hmm. I've talked to people who have become Catholic and were married, were clergy of a different, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Been there, done that. Yeah, yeah there exactly. you go, right? right. And there's going to be, and they say, and especially the wives say, 
they feel neglected on yeah. some level because he, he does have to care for these souls that he be, has been entrusted with. So having this celibate life is tough, but at the same time, I'm able to spend long hours at night in prayer, doing research, preparing homilies, talking to souls in spiritual direction and so forth, that if I had a wife and kids, I would really, my time should be with them, yeah. right? And so there needs to be a real focus. Uh, and that's the beauty of the Latin rite is we have, you know, of Catholicism, we have both sides of the coin. We have the Latin rite, which, mm -hmm. you know, celibate, and we have all many of the other rites where you can get married. Yeah. Have you ever seen a one-sided coin? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to have both. Yeah, yeah. There's the beauty of the wisdom of that different cultural issues. Mm -hmm. Let's. Uh, we got an email from um, uh, Anne in Florida, and uh, she writes, "As a cradle Catholic, I've always been intrigued by the prophecy of Simeon, and would be interested in any thoughts Father Calloway could share on this passage." Quote, "Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against." And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. End mm. of quote. And also she asks, how did Father Calloway view Mary as an Episcopalian? First question, the issue of Simeon. Yeah, oh, that's loaded because there's the Christological element there dealing with Christ. He's going to be a contradiction for many. Yeah. Uh, it's the scandal of the cross. You know, what is this? God dying on a cross? I mean, why should this be? You know, and, and, and many people have struggled with that throughout the ages. How could God become incarnate, become flesh, and then allow us to kill him? I mean, this is a scandal for those who, who don't <laughs> penetrate this through prayer. Um, so that's the Christological element that uh, is, is, we could go on, <laughs> books have been written about this. And then there's the Mary, Marian element, the Mariological element, that her heart is pierced. Um, and there's a lot that's been written on that as well. And I like to, to look at that passage like this. Uh, Mary being like the, the new Eve, next, standing by the new Adam. Mm. She's our mother in the order of grace. Um, she only gave birth to one son in her body, and that's Jesus Christ. She is perpetual virgin. Uh, and yet her heart, as it were, God used it like a spiritual womb. And he put all of his children in there to be born. And in giving birth to us spiritually, it hurt her. Because she was at the foot of the cross and undergoing an agony and a torture as her son and her savior was crucified in her presence. And God used her heart like a womb so that we could be born. Like we say in the church that the baptismal font is the womb of Christians. Well, Mary's heart is like that as well. Uh, and that's why... From the cross, we hear Jesus say, Woman, behold your son. Uh, there was a birthing event happening there. The church mm. is born through the new Eve, and that womb is her heart. Um, I'll come back to that uh, verse a little bit, because there's, uh, going back to the Christological side, there's a sense in, um, talk about this if you would, Father, mm. that the fall and rising of many in Israel uh, kind of connects with the idea that uh, often, maybe through bad catechesis or other reasons, we come up with our own idea what God is like. Yeah. And then when we encounter God mm. and find out He's a whole lot different than we expect, mm. it's either going to convert us mm. or drive us away, which is what happened to Israel. Right. They had an image of what the Messiah will be like. Right. And here comes a Jesus who isn't like they thought, who dies on a cross. Yeah, yeah. And so it's either going to bring the conversion, like Paul, right, right. or the backing of a way. Yeah. I'm thinking as a priest, you might deal with this all the time. I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. The people in the pews, right, from right. the pulpit, you're trying to convert them to Jesus, yep. but you're running against oh, yeah. false ideas of what God expects of them, what God's like. If you... Oh, yeah, across the board, on every level. I mean, I, I think nowadays a lot of, of what I encounter is a lot of people have created kind of a, a new age Jesus of some sort, that he's a tree-hugging hippie who, you know, gazes at his navel to find inner freedom, and he's trying to, this is what they think Jesus is. And so when I'm up there speaking about moral issues, and, you know, yep. this is right, and this is where the black and whiteness of Christianity, wow, you know, they really don't understand that. And, uh, and yet they thought that they knew Jesus, and yet they kind of made Jesus in their own image. Uh, that's a big problem today on, on a lot of different levels. People yeah. are doing that. Yeah, the, um, uh, oh boy, I, the, 
this, this particular issue of, um, I look at where you came from, mm. uh, and all of a sudden, like you said, God is asking you to live a moral life. Yeah. And uh, do we want to this, this of Jesus? And uh, people have this redefinition. Oh, good, we have an email. I know I wanted to, to uh, try another email. That's why I was a little bit distracted there. I knew we, <laughs> this email comes from Ron from Ohio. I'm a young man discerning my vocation. What steps can I take to help me learn if the priesthood is where God is leading? Oh, that's great. Oh, I'm delighted to hear that. Uh, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> um, prayer is the foundation. You, you just have to keep asking our Lord, Lord, what, is, what do you want me to do? Uh, I'm willing to, to be of service to you. I love you. And spending that time with him, reading over the scriptures, speaking heart to heart with our Savior, and letting him lead you and guide you. That's the foundation. You don't, you're, if you're called, you're called. You're not going to be choosing this on your own. It's because you're accepting the initiation of our Lord, inviting you to mm -hmm. this particular vocation. And then also, you know, you just want to be going deeper in your devotional life. You want to make sure that you are um, tuning out some of these things from the world that can really distract you. Mm -hmm. uh, TV, you know, in some level, you, 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 if you're discerning, it might be time a good time to turn off some of those programs you used to watch, <laughs> not EWTN, of course, uh, but a lot of other things. That, so you can really get focused, quieted down, and, and learn from the Lord what it is that He's asking of you. Prayer, without prayer, it's not going to happen. It's the foundation of it all. Because this issue of calling from a Catholic perspective might be a little different than where our non-Catholic brothers and sisters sometimes mm -hmm. think of calling from mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you should talk about that because when you get away from the authority of the church, mm -hmm. sacred tradition, mm -hmm. and you get into groups where it's Bible only, um, their understanding of calling, mm -hmm. they'll take passages from Scripture. You know, mm -hmm. St. Paul's knocked off his horse. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, mm -hmm. okay, God didn't knock me off a horse. How do I know he's calling me to do this? Or, right. you know, Isaiah, here I am, send me. Well, yeah. what is the uniqueness of God has a plan for my life? Do I have to discover that? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, do I spit in my hand to figure out which way he wants me to go? <laughs> I mean, how does it? Right. Well, I think that, like, if, if people have maybe not a clear understanding of what that call is, just think of it in terms of mission. You know, the church, uh, the Lord says, go out to all nations and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's speaking that to his church, you know, and if, if we love Jesus Christ, we've all been entrusted with this mission to go out. And the particulars of, of it is that we're not all going to do it in the same way. Uh, but at the same time, you're going to have a particular area of work where you're going to live with your family, the, the job that you have, a particular location, where you're going to be called to fulfill that mission. That's your calling. The mission, the being sent out, the, you know, that's what an apostle is, to go forth as an ambassador mm -hmm. of Christ and to fulfill the mission that you've been entrusted with, which is a call to bring souls to Jesus Christ. We have an email from John in New Jersey, and he writes, I have a non-religious background and feel that God is drawing me to a closer relationship with him. What practical advice would Father Calloway have for me to deepen my relationship with God? Thank you, John. Wow. Okay. Wow. Two things come to mind at first. And John, that's, that's great. I, I love the question. Uh, once again, I'll just go back to the prayer. You know, uh, if you want to know somebody, if you come from a non-religious background, if you want to get to know somebody, you have to talk to them. And that's what prayer is, just talking to God. And talk to them in open, honest ways. Um, I like to say if you have to throw little um, uh, spiritual temper tantrums, you know, for God, and it, when you're talking to Him initially to get that conversation going, mm -hmm. go ahead. You talk to him and tell him where you've struggled. Tell him your weaknesses, the things that you've really, misconceptions you've had about him. That's okay. You know, he's your father and he wants to hear that. And then from there, you can actually hear him speaking to you when you take up the scriptures and read the Bible. Read what he's saying to you. He loves you. And he's, he's written this in there because he wants you to hear his word and to be fed and nourished by that word. And that word, in fact, when you pick it up every day and read it, will nourish and feed your soul. And you'll find yourself growing in that relationship and falling madly in love with this God that you never knew, but that you discovered is, in fact, your Father. Different um, traditions within the church have different uh, spiritual piety. Mm. You know, Jesuits have their uh, particular Jesuit exercises mm -hmm. and 
and the Carmelites will have theirs, yeah. you know, different ones. Yeah. Uh, and uh, from your background, divine, right. I'm, I'm assuming it's Divine Mercy Chaplet, but yeah. but we'll talk about that to someone like him mm. who's doesn't come from religious background. Yeah. You just ask him to pray, mm. and he's wondering, well, what, yeah. what, what does that mean? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's true. There's, there, you're right. There's different traditions of prayer and, and all kinds of things that you can do with devotionals and so forth. Um, yeah, one concrete thing that you can do, uh, prayer on the scriptures, praying over the scriptures, is a great mm. way to grow in your relationship with God. And in particular, in Catholic tradition, uh, the rosary is a very powerful way because you're praying over the scriptures, mm -hmm. these sanctified words, you know, that have brought us life. And through praying the rosary, you're actually praying over the saving mysteries of our faith. You know, the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary, the, the birth of the Messiah, you know, Jesus presented in the temple, Jesus found in the temple, all of these things. These are wonderful ways uh, through taking up a devotional like the rosary, mm -hmm. grounded in scripture, and falling in love with Jesus Christ. All right. Let's take an email from Carol from Michigan. And it looks like she's reflecting on, on uh, part of your own journey, Father. Mm. As a Protestant, I never understood the Catholic Church's position on contraception. Mm. Is this a decision for each couple to make? Thank you, Carol. Well, I mean, yes. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, you know, the, the truthfulness of it is, is that it's a teaching of the church, church that, like all the teachings of the church, are meant to set us free so that we've we've been unshackled from these chains of the world and what the world would tell us uh, that our choices can we can do with our choices everyone has the freedom to to make a choice but that doesn't mean that the choices that you're making are necessarily the good ones we have free will God doesn't come in and take away our free will so every Catholic you know should surrender to this truth and adhere to this truth because the church is our mother. Mm -hmm. And as our mother, like a good mother, she says to us, you can play within these bounds. This is for your goodness and your happiness and your freedom. But if you go outside, there's wolves out there and they'll attack you and they'll rip you apart. These teachings are meant for our freedom. Now the children inside, they can say, well, I'm going to run outside and play outside the pen. Well, watch out what's going to happen. You could find yourself, you know, outside of the household of God, and then you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. These teachings of the church are meant for us to acknowledge the church in her wisdom, the teaching body of Christ, you know, the, the pillar and bulwark of the truth is the church. And so when you listen to Holy Mother Church, you find your freedom. And when you give that assent to it, what a joy, what a delight, you know, to, to be able to say, yes, that is the truth. I myself assent to it, acknowledgement, acknowledge it and I am free to live fully as a child of God. I want to push you on that, this issue a little bit, not the issue of contraception, but this issue of, of deciding right and wrong. Mm. Because uh, if you come from a background where it's just Bible only, mm. then uh, you just you try and decide an issue like, let's say, contraception. Well, where, yeah. is, it, where is that in the Bible? Right. So how do you decide that? Mm -hmm. uh, abortion. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on how you define whether abortion is murder or not or whether it's a human person mm. then you end up if you're going bible only right so you you need the teacher guided by the holy spirit yeah former episcopalian mm. and i know you weren't a card carrying <laughs> practicing uh right uh, maybe the model of what a good episcopalian was right but i'd like you to give your thoughts on how is it that a denomination mm. Mm. can seemingly be itself moving in such a pro-choice direction on lifestyles that mm. traditionally were always recognized right. as immoral, right. yet we find within an entire, we, we see this in a number of non-Catholic yeah. denominations, slowly yeah. uh, defining things as good that were always considered evil. Right, right. What's going on there from your perspective? Uh, this is there's a spiritual battle going on here because um, to cave in on some of these issues is really to to bow to you know the standards of the world and not the standards of Christ uh, and ultimately you know it, it goes back to you know Matthew 16 you are Peter and on this rock I build my church and you you have the keys of the kingdom you know what you bind on earth it is bound in heaven and loosed on earth is loosed in heaven it comes back to that authority 
uh, that's transmitting to us the authentic teaching of Jesus Christ here in you know, uh, the century in which we live. Because you're right, there are certain issues that are not technically in the Bible. Abortion, you're not going to find that technically in there, nor contraception. Right. And there's some other issues, very important issues. So, Jesus, what did you mean? What would you do today? Uh, how do we know? How, what, how would you interpret this? And that goes back to he's speaking to us today through the teaching body of the church, the magisterium, which means teaching, uh, and through the office of Peter. So vitally important. And when you don't have that, you can find yourself winging it, caving to the standards of the world. And things that were taken for granted in days of old, marriage between a man and a woman, now you might find yourself questioning it and saying, hmm, well, it's not technically in the Bible, so maybe we can we cave a little bit on that. Not well, good. It, it, you take three issues, for example, which really strike at America in many ways in our history. You've got contraception. Yeah. Every church up till 1920 yeah. agreed yeah. on that. It was the Episcopalians, that, yeah. the Anglicans, that fudged on that in the Lambeth Conference of mm. 1930, I think mm. it was. But it's not in Scripture. Right. You can go to the, the own an issue and you'll tell, but right. what, what is there? Okay. Um, homosexuality. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but the Bible's all over about that. Yeah, it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear in there. <laughs> yeah. um, all Christian groups were united on that mm, mm. until, well, it's just been in the last 30, 40 years. Right. We've had a movement on that. Yeah. Slavery. Mm, mm. Now, the reason that's a complicated issue is that there's a lot of verses in the Bible that seem to say slavery's all right. right, right. Paul doesn't challenge it. Ephesians, mm -hmm. Colossians. It's all over the place right. at First Peter, right. master and slave. It's yeah. just telling you how a master... So again, if it's Bible alone, that's right. why we in America right. defended slavery. Hmm. Even though, and, and I've even learned this geez, even more and more, the Catholic Church never hmm. defended slavery. Catholics did. <laughs> right. Even yeah. Catholics own slaves. It's a sad <laughs> issue. Yeah. But the church didn't. The Pope's yeah. all... St. Peter always spoke out against slavery. Yeah. You know, there's an example. Yeah. Sure. Of the authority of the church and not the Bible alone mm. or conscience alone. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. What do you do with those issues right. unless you have a church you can trust? Yeah, exactly. Well, when I was becoming Catholic, I, I had to take a hard look at that because, you know, almost all of my relatives are not Catholic uh, and many of them are not even Christian at all. And it, it baffled me that um, a lot of them were just church hopping. You know, where they went wherever the, the, the preaching seemed good until it ruffled them and challenge them. Then they didn't like what that pastor said, so they went and found a new church to comfort mm -hmm. them. And I thought to myself, you know, if that's it, I should just become my own pastor and start my own church and do my own thing. Right. But I said, I want the real message, not one that's just adapting to my likes and needs. I need the real one, even though it sting me. You know, because I look at it this way, you're never going to catch a fish with a dull hook. It's, it's got to have a point and a barb to it, and, and, and it's got to get in. And that's the mystery and the beauty of Catholicism, is it comes with a sting, yeah. but it's what really sets you free. The most common, uh, uh, sincere, though not right, drive that I hear in all these new evangelical churches that are propping up everywhere, mm. is they look at everything and they say, we're going to do it right. Mm. We're going to do Acts 2 mm. all mm -hmm. over again. Right. And then over and over again, it's this reinventing yeah. of the wheel. They want to do what's right. Mm -hmm. They want to follow Jesus. Yeah, yeah. But immediately there's compromise right. on all different levels. We have another email, uh, Kathleen in California. As a former Episcopalian who has recently been received into the Catholic Church. Well, you, you haven't recently been received, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember back. What is the best way for me to share my new faith with my family and friends who are still Episcopalian? Okay, she's a... She's a new convert to the church. Mm -hmm. How do you share it back with your old Episcopalian family and friends? Yeah, it can be challenging because uh, a lot of people may not understand what, why you've made the decision that you've made. I can tell you what not to do. <laughs> I learned this the hard way. Uh, when I you know, became Catholic, um, I was a little too overzealous initially, and I tried to force it down people's throat. You know, this is Catholicism, and you've you know, you got to accept it now and everything. And I was a little too you know, aggressive in my approach. I had to learn. Yeah. You know, how to do it tactfully, how to do it with great love and, and care and concern for people. A lot of people haven't known they've been misinformed about Catholicism. Right. They, they've heard about it on TV or they've read about it in Time magazine and their, their understandings are really off. Yeah. The best thing to do is to 
uh, do not abandon them by any means. Love your family, even though there's a, there's a difference here. Uh, pray with them. Uh, encourage them in their love for Jesus Christ and, and to pursue that relationship with Him on a deeper level. Let your example shine forth in a brilliant way. By you having your life changed by falling in love with Christ and becoming Catholic, you know, that's going to have an effect upon uh, the things that you watch on TV, the things that you listen to, uh, the way that you speak, the words you use, you, your language should be cleaned up, you should be becoming a better person on so many different levels that that in and of itself should be something, a draw to them. Like St. Francis says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Yeah. You know, it'll show, it'll shine forth. Just strive well, that, to live it. That is so key because in that uh, verse in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3, 15, where it says, be ready at all times to give a reason for the yeah. hope is in you. It says, but do it with gentleness and yeah. a clear conscience. Yeah, that's right. Because your words don't mean squat. That's right. If they don't match your life. Right, that's right. I yeah. mean, that's that really the, the bottom line issue. Um, yeah. uh, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to say a, a, a prayer for two things I'd like to do as we close the program. One, I'd like you to say a prayer mm. for any people out there who are right now like where you were. Mm. Yeah. If you could say a prayer for them. You betcha. Maybe a word of why they should come home, but also a prayer for them and then a, and close with a blessing. Sure, if you, if absolutely. You could, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of our faith. And we ask you to touch the hearts of those watching who, Lord, want to go deeper and are experiencing the beauty of Catholicism. Maybe just need that push, that guide to, mm -hmm. to help them to make that, that decision uh, to come over and to join this beautiful family of the Catholic Church. Father, we ask you to give, you that, to give them that special grace, that courage to know that you are their Father, drawing them into this family that you have established and to help them to go deeper in their prayer through taking up the scriptures, through taking up into their hands even the catechism of the Catholic Church and all of its beauty, all of its richness that saints have died for, Father, to give us this beauty that you desire through sending your Son into the world to transmit to us the fullness of life and the beauty of Catholicism. And we ask for blessings upon all the viewers, all the listeners, all the people that they are praying for and for everyone that all people would come to know the wonder and the mystery of our Savior, our Lord, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is forever the light of the world. And we ask this blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we've got just a little bit of time, Father. If you would recite to the audience the words of the Divine Chaplet, just a little repetitive thing to help them understand oh, what sure. that, the significance of the core of that prayer, sure, if you would. Sure. Uh, the prayer goes like this, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Mm -hmm. And that's basically acknowledging the, the priestly character of the whole Christian people of God, that we are all offering up to the Father that which saves us, the mm -hmm. flesh of the Messiah, Father, for the sake of your Son who died on the cross for us, have mercy on us, yeah. because He came to reveal your merciful face. You are the merciful Father. There's a, a subtle theology in there that I think is uniquely Catholic, and that it, it isn't for our sake, mm. Mm. for the sake of thy sorrow. That's right, passion. that's There's right. This, Redemptive suffering, this offering it up. That's right. Which is uniquely Catholic, which I wonder if we're losing a little bit today. Yeah, and when the Father looks upon us, He looks upon us through the wounds of His Son for the sake of your Son and what He did for us. Father, have mercy. That's beautiful theology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so normally you, if it's prayed like the rosary. On the rosary beads, on that's the rosary right. Beads, just in case yeah. someone's It takes about five it. minutes. All right, and I'm sure if you want to know more about that, you can go to EWTN.com on the website and find out all information about that. You can listen to it prayed on EWTN. That's right. And so uh, you can also contact Father and his community to find out more about his work. It was also a book, No Turning Back, A Witness to Mercy by Father Donald Calloway. Father, thank you for joining us thank on you. the Journey Home program. It's a pleasure. We'll get you back another time, maybe another time on the program. We can even have more time for phone calls and emails. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's just, we, we've been through these days of preparation. And uh, just a little bit more of Lent, 
But if we haven't experienced the beauty and the surrender that we need to as we prepare for the celebration of, you, uh, of Easter, the Divine, Divine Mercy Chaplet mm. is a way to remember how much God has done for us in the life and death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus, our Lord. Let's make sure that we prepare ourselves by grace for the full reception of our Savior. God bless you. See you again next week. Thank you.